One. All right. We did it. We are officially live. Mr. Uh, Christopher Cox is COO of Aperture. I'm excited to dive in today. Uh, myself and some listeners, you want to give a little background in yourself and what you guys are up to at Aperture? Happy to. Sure. Hi, Mike. Thanks for having me. So as you said, Chris Cox, COO of Aperture, and I'm also the general manager of our community banking business. So Aperture is a digital banking company. So what that means is we provide the tools, solutions that financial institutions need to engage with their customers through digital channels, which is a mouthful. So traditionally, that means we provide online and mobile banking, which is what we do. But as we expand into additional channels, um, as we expand into um, allowing financial institutions to engage in different types of partnerships, you know, we provide those solutions as well. Awesome. And uh, what uh, what got you into this? I mean, what what drew your attention? And you didn't start the company; you joined a few years ago. Uh, why Aperture? What it, what I guess attracted you to this project? Yeah. So Aperture, we're, we're an interesting company, right? We're kind of a hybrid of a mature business and a startup. So we actually spun out of a larger company called First Data, which is a giant global payments company. Um, at the end of 2017 to create a new company called Aperture. So I was um, leading First Data's digital banking business, and that's the business that we actually spun out to create this new company called Aperture. So we did that when we, when we spun out of First Data. We actually created a new joint venture that is bet- was between First Data and Live Oak Bank. Live Oak Bank is here in Wilmington, North Carolina, it's a really uh, modern tech forward bank founded in 2008. It's a small, primarily focused on small business lending, but Live Oak Bank has been, you know, they're a great bank, but they, you know, as much as they've been a successful bank, they've been in the business of creating software solutions to run their bank and then spinning those solutions out into the market as separate companies. So mm-hmm. they were really interested in what was happening in digital engagement, what was possible through digital banking channels. So uh, we put together what we had at First Data in terms of a legacy business with a group of engineers and product folks from Live Oak Bank and created this new company called Aperture. Interesting. Um, I'm I'm fairly familiar with First Data, and they have a a great reputation. I'd say they're you know a large company. They do a lot of different things. Uh, you you were there 12 years. Is that right? I was. That's right. So so yeah, First Data is a great company. It actually uh, recently merged with Fiserv. So First Data itself no longer exist. So First Data and Fiserv came together to create you know, a new, bigger Fiserv company. But I was there at First Data um, for about 12 years. So focused mostly on product, on digital innovation. So First Data is primarily a payments company. So think about you know, on the merchant side of things, um, all the, uh, everything, all the solutions that merchants need to accept electronic payments of any form, credit cards, debit cards, gift cards, et cetera. First Data was involved in all aspects of that business. And then on the on the bank side, right, or the card issuing side, so everything a financial institution needs to do to issue payment products and have transactions processed, First Data was involved in all those aspects of the payments value chain. So at First Data, I had some really interesting opportunities to work on you know, the early days of mobile payments, right? So we saw this convergence of smartphones and mobile technology, with traditional retail payments, credit and debit cards, we had some ideas about how those th- two things might come together and what it might mean to First Data's business. And you know, I got to be involved in the early days of launching um, the original Google Wallet, as an example, Samsung Pay, some work on the early iterations of Apple Pay. And that was really the you know, First Data as a payment processor and as a company who had a huge merchant client uh, footprint and a huge card issuer client footprint. And how could we bring capabilities of First Data together with some of these mobile tech companies who are working on payments products? So that mm. was really fun and interesting. So did those did Google, Samsung, Apple? Did they see First Data as a uh, an avenue to getting out into merchants? I mean, what did First Data have that uh, that that made these you know large tech companies want to work with them? Yeah. So I mean, for, First Data specifically, you know was and still is under Fiserv, sort of all things payment infrastructure, 
right? So, you know, the ability to, you know, for banks to issue payment cards and for merchants to accept, you know, payment cards as transactions, you know, today that just, that's just how we do things, right? And it just seems like that's just normal. But, you know, First Data was one of the companies who, you know, over a period of decades really made all of that possible. So, mm. you know, really in the middle of all things payment infrastructure. So, you know, when some of these technology companies were looking to enter the world of payments for a variety of different reasons, right? They ha- they all had their own business cases around why it made sense for them to participate in payments at some point in the value chain. First Data was a natural place to look because, you know, so many clients, so many parts of the infrastructure, so many solutions. So the part of, you know, those early mobile payment solutions that I was involved in was, um, uh, we called it TSM or Trusted Service Manager at the time. But that really is the process of getting a payment card onto a mobile device for use at a merchant point of sale. And the reason First Data was involved with that, so if you think about the legacy world of plastic cards, right? So there's a whole process that a company like First Data enables on behalf of card issuers where, you know, they're they're embossing plastic cards with cardholder information, encoding the chip on the card or the mag stripe on the card, putting that card in an envelope and then mailing it out to the cardholder on behalf of the financial institution. That was a well-established business that First Data had. So then you think about mm. what's the digital equivalent of that? How do you get a virtual card provisioned, not in an envelope and mail, but sent over the air onto a phone so that it can be used, you know, to make a payment transaction. And that was, those were some of the early, early things that I, at least I was involved in at First Data in terms of mobile payments. Interesting. Yeah, yeah. they're a super interesting company. When in 2013, I was running a, a business, a startup called Zing Checkout, and we were at ETA conference uh-huh. and first data had you know the the largest booth and they were you know <laughs> just a huge company and i was always so interested in what what did they do years ago that got them in that position cuz payments is it seems like to me the large companies uh have a have a first mover advantage in some sort of technological way and then they just double down and build relationships with merchants and those are the most defensible difficult businesses to disrupt you know once a restaurant uses their setup well they're probably just going to keep it that way that's right and uh yeah i always saw first data as what would be the threat i mean the threat is is it is it stripe i mean do you see some consolidation in the space because of um pressure from from technology companies changing the way that things are done. Like you said, the over the air updates are just the wave of the future. And so your incumbent technology of printing plastic cards and mailing them is less valuable. So it's kind of the, you know, the, the balance between how do you take advantage of your existing business while building a new one and not to touch on first data too much, but I just, I just find it interesting to kind of uh, set the, set the stage. Yeah. uh, Uh, Good question. So, I mean, I, I wasn't, you know, around or involved in the, in the early, early days of First Data. So I can't speak to that, but I can say, you know, First Data, you know, now part of Fiserv, great company, great management team, you know, has always been at the forefront um, of innovation as it relates to payments, right? And, you know, some of that is First Data, you know, creating innovation and creating things that are possible with payments that, you know, that wasn't possible before, some of it is responding to new competitive threats and new opportunities that didn't exist as, you know, with prior generations of technology. So, so Mike, maybe one example is, you know, when Square first came out, mm. right? And it was that little Square dongle that you put in your cell phone, your mobile phone jack. Um, it was really, you know, geared toward what we would have called micro merchants, right? Or mom and pop. So, you know, really small businesses, who maybe don't have a retail counter and aren't, they're not accepting credit card payments all day, every day, but they need to in certain cases. And that was where Square really went out. And, you know, I think the reaction of First Data at first was kind of like, well, those are really small businesses, right? And, you know, maybe that's not exactly where we're focused right now. But I think what was really great about that for First Data is, you know, Square showed a model where, you know, really simplified pricing and really simplified contractual structures was really attractive to those you know smaller merchants and that has sort of carried its way into the industry so it's just that's an example right where mm-hmm. yes you know square technology was great interesting new market segment but also helped larger companies like first data understand like 
where they can make improvements, you know, to better serve their clients. So that was, that was really beneficial. And then, you you know, you look at a company like Stripe and, you know, what that showed, there are just so many more places where payment cards are accepted today than they used to be. Right. And that, you know, so in-app payments, you know, online payments, payments that are embedded in, you know, ordering apps, et cetera. And, you know, first data, Fiserv, and again, I've been away for, for a little while, but they were really at the forefront of, you know, making sure that credit card payments, de- debit card payments could be accepted in those new channels as they evolved. But companies like Stripe, you know, they showed what was possible or what the potential was there. So, hmm. And then, so you're, you're working inside this large company, first data. Uh-huh. How does the process go of spinning out a new entity? I mean, do you guys sit around a table and say, hey, we really should have like an R&D lab and then you fund that. Some people, you know, investigate where there's opportunity. Uh, you launch something in the market, it goes well. And we're like, hey, we need someone to come run this. Chris, you know, why don't you jump on the bandwagon and off you go? I mean, is that more or less what happens or how, how I've, in your own words, how did the, the story kind of go down? <laughs> yeah, well, you know, it probably happens, you know, differently in all kinds of different situations. But in my case, um, you know, First Data had acquired a a digital banking startup back in the mid 2000s. It was a company called Funds Express in Austin, Texas. Great company. It was one of the first companies, you know, when all businesses were going online, um, including banks, right? So the early days of online banking, Funds Express in Austin, Texas was one of the first companies who jumped into that void to create a new solution set for banks. So First Data, um, somewhere along the way, it's before I was involved, but it was, I think it was around 2007, acquired this company, Funds Express, in Austin, Texas. And, you know, great tuck-in acquisition for First Data, right? While First Data is primarily a payments company and a big payments company, they've got, you know, salespeople out there selling different solutions to financial institutions, credit processing, debit processing, et cetera. So here is another solution that those sales reps can talk to their financial institution clients about digital banking. So that's why First Data acquired Funds Express. And then, you know, un- underneath the First Data umbrella, uh, First Data ran that business, you know, for a while. And then at some point along the way, I think this was in 2016 or so, you know, it's a, it's a, it's a small-ish, nice little business unit inside of First Data. And um, I had the opportunity to run that business unit, which was... Um, you know, a great, a great opportunity for me. And, you know, when we looked at, we really looked at it from the client perspective, right? So were those digital banking clients of first data getting what they needed in terms of innovation, investment in the platform, you know, attention from the company in terms of building relationships and support and all of those sorts of things. And there were just opportunities for improvement, right? And this isn't because First Data was a bad company, but it was just because, the, you know, here's this smallish little digital banking business unit inside of a giant payments company. First Data mostly focused on payments. And, you know, what do we do with this small digital banking company? So we just looked at what is the best way to make sure that these these clients of the First Data digital banking solution get what they need, especially as, the, and we can talk in a little bit, but especially as, the market in digital banking is, you know, evolving so rapidly. And, you know, we just collectively made the decision and it wasn't me, right? These were some of the senior people at First Data to say, there's probably a good chance, you know, if we find the right partners to spend this business out, you know, to inject some more investment into the business, inject some more, you know, maybe engineering product talent into the business so that it really has a chance to grow. And I think it was, um, you know, I think it was a kind of a bold decision for First Data to say, "Here's a great business and a great market segment, and um, you know, let's we, we think maybe we can give it a better chance to grow if we can spin it out." So that team can mm. really focus just on this business and just on this customer segment. So that's mm. how the idea of spinning it out came from, and then we went through the whole process of spinning it out. Yeah, yeah, I'm so curious about this. I, I want to ask you, um, you know, when I think of startups in the early days, a lot of the decisions, you use as much data as you can, but oftentimes you don't have a ton of data. And so the decisions aren't massively consequential or they may not be that expensive. But in the case of first data, you may be dealing in the, you know, tens of millions, hundreds of millions of dollars 
plus uh, type of a decision. And they tend to be one way doors. You know, you can't spin out this company and then say, oh, never mind, that's not working. Let's bring it back in. I, I, it would be incredibly expensive and costly. How do you see the people in the table who made that decision or other decisions like this? How do you see the, the good versus the greats? Are the, the people who are making really great decisions on spinning out businesses or buying companies, is it is it are they relying heavily on data or customer conversations, or is it just maybe a sixth sense uh, as to what would work and what doesn't? I mean, how do you how would you know whether these things are? Is it pattern matching and just saying, well, a lot of customers are looking for this kind of service. You know, I bet if we spin it out and it's you know finger up in the air and let's just do it. Uh, I'm curious how how much of a kind of gut decision was it or is is it generally uh, versus like this is a highly quantified and analyzed. You know, you have a team of people diving into the data on this. Um, yeah. So yeah. At least in the case of a company like First Data, right, who has, you know, a really, you know, seasoned, experienced leadership team, um, it's not a gut feel, right? So there was, you know, very extensive business case that went that went into supporting the idea of we should spend this business out um, because we think it'll be on a, gr a different growth trajectory if we do it. Right. So, and, and it takes, you know, really strong executives at a company like First Data to make a decision like that. I mean, so they're, they're weighing things like, you know, relative to the overall customer base of First Data, where does this solution set fit in relative to our overall investment portfolio? So when we're looking at the strategy of big First Data and looking at, you know, where do we need to make investments to grow, you know, really grow big First Data on behalf of the shareholder base? You know, they're always making trade-off decisions and and it's, I guess it's a long way of saying it's not gut feel, right? And they don't mm -hmm. even, you know, I, I would describe, you know, the business that we spun out as relatively small, at least in the context of big first data. It's a big business, right? But in the context of first data, it's relatively small. Um, but even in, in that context, it's not just gut feel. So they really want to understand, you know, the business case behind the idea of spinning it out. What's the strategy behind spinning it out? What will be the short-term, medium-term, long-term objectives when mm -hmm. you spin it out? And therefore, what you know? How do we think about the financial forecast relative to executing on those objectives? And and you would you have put together like a PowerPoint deck and effectively, it's in a way, it's kind of like you're pitching investors. You know, you're that's. Uh, is that how it felt? That's exactly. I mean, that's a really good way to say it. Um, and yeah. we, you know, I I got to work with you know really smart corporate strategy people at First Data, and really smart corp corporate dev people at First Data. Who are the people who do you know M and A and these kinds of transactions? But I mean, really, kind of pitching it to both sides, right? So we're, we are proposing spinning this business out and creating a new joint venture between First Data and Live Oak Bank, who's going to make their own investment in the business. So it really was kind of like you know, pitching to investors, it just you know, some from first data and some from, from my book bank. Mm, interesting. Uh, I dig it. Yeah. Thanks yeah. for diving down that rabbit hole. So you guys spun out yeah. in, uh, let's see, 2017. Is that right? That's right. End of 2017. And, and the initial structure was, uh, it was not a, was it, or was it not a new company when you spun it out? I mean, new as in uh, separate from first data, it's now an independent company as a consumer would recognize it. That's right. And so ind independent company. So l legally a separate entity and new brand name, all of that. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And then, um, so you would own it. Uh, executives would have a piece of the equity in the company. First data I'm sure has, has a significant portion of the company, but it's yeah structured independently, operating independently. You got it. That's uh, right. So, so both live Oak and first initially both live Oak and first data, you know, were the primary, equity owners of the company. And then, you know, our philosophy is every employee of Aperture should have some equity in the company to share in the growth potential of the company. So there was, you know, a small per percentage of equity that was allocated to employees mm -hmm. of the new company. Awesome. And, and where are you guys in terms of uh, employees or, or revenue or customers or some way to indicate uh, the, the traction that you've attained so far? Yeah. So we have um, about 250 employees today. 
we have um, right around 400 clients and our clients are financial institutions. So that means either banks or credit unions. And then mm-hmm. I won't go into details on the, on the financials, but you know, we're seeing some, some good revenue growth relative to where we spun the company out. Mm, awesome. Awesome. Yeah. yeah. So things seem to be going well. And it, it, the initial spin out was uh, how many people did it start with in 2017? I ha- I think it was about, don't, don't quote me on this. I say it yeah. as, I'm a, as I'm on a podcast, but I think it was about, no one's listening. Yeah, it was about, it was about 80 people. I think when we, when we, first yeah. Met. Okay. Yeah. So that okay, was, yeah. uh, you think about that as, you know, software engineers, product people, um, managers from first data and then software engineers and product people from live Oak bank that we put together. And then, you know, almost immediately we're building an executive team. So we hired a CFO and some other people. Um, and then, you know, the way, the way these spinouts are structured, at least this one, you know, we, we, the business was wrapped by a whole bunch of shared services inside of first data. So, you know, you can think of almost everything, right. Finance, accounting, marketing, procurement, all mm-hmm. of those, you know, when we are inside of first data, we're supported by kind of big company shared services. So when we started Aperture, we started under a transition service agreement, meaning we continued to get some of those support services from First Data and some from Live Oak. And then we had put together a plan where we hire our own staff, put our own tools in place, put our own um, processes in place, and then we're ready to turn off shared services from First Data or Live Oak. We can do it. So we. It's like, yeah, it's like cutting the lifeline. You have yeah. to cut the umbilical cord. You got it. <laughs> you got it. Hire, I mean, hire live. That was great for us because, you know, we got to, we got to really look at, um, you know, where we needed to make immediate improvements to the business and we could kind of start with a blank sheet of paper, right? So an example of that would be the total customer experience, right? Or customer support. So done, you know, pretty well at first data, a ton of opportunity for improvement. So, you know, we got to start with just a complete blank sheet of paper. We hired our own team. We put all of our, you know, hire our, our own team, meaning we structured it the way we felt would provide the best support to our clients, put our own tools in place, launch our own processes. So it's really cool. You don't very often get a chance. When I say we're an interesting hybrid of a mature business and a startup, you don't very often get a chance to say, let's just do this right, but you're doing it to, you know, an existing client base and, you know, tens of million dollars of revenue. So that was, that was yeah. fun to do. Yeah. Yeah, super interesting. You know, yeah. just from a conceptual standpoint, because you're, you know, you're very much like, a, you know, a running business. Eighty people is is no joke. Yeah. Uh, but you're also like spinning out. It's kind of like starting a startup at at eighty people. That's where right. You're, you're, you, you, I mean, you have to have a lot of DNA from from first data, just culturally. Eventually, you know, you start to spin off and do, you know, build your own culture separate from them. But being part of them, I'm sure, is a huge influence. Um, yeah, that's just interesting from like a case study standpoint, <laughs> all the things that yeah, go and, well, the things and, that don't, yeah. Yeah, you got it. Exactly. And, and you know, a big part, part of our culture at Aperture came from Live Oak Bank also, right? So it was sort of mm-hmm. emerging in those two cultures, but you know, DNA from first data, you know, unlike maybe a pure startup, you know, we come with, or we came with, you know, all kinds of regulatory compliance experience mm-hmm. and know-how in, you know, information security experience and, and know how, which we need, right? Because we are running banking infrastructure for banks and credit unions. So it was really nice for us to come with that sort of already baked into our DNA. Yeah. So tell me what the pitch is. So you have a, a bank on the phone, uh, you're going to, you know, try to convince them to use Aperture. What's the, what's the pitch? What's the. Yeah, you got it. So I, so I guess maybe a little context. So we actually, um, we're targeted at two different market segments with uh, two different platforms. And I'll explain what that means. So we, the business that came out of first data, we call Aperture Express. So that's the legacy business. It is uh, targeted at uh, smaller community banks and credit unions. So the sweet spot for Aperture Express is, and banks and credit unions are measured or categorized by asset size. So you probably know this, but so, uh, banks and credit unions that are 500 million to call it $2 billion in asset size are perfect for Aperture Express. And I'll explain that in a minute. We, and on Express, we've got clients who are much larger than that. But in terms of the sweet spot, that's a sweet spot. And then when we started Aperture, 
you know, in addition to um, improving the business that spun out of first data, we started building a new API banking platform that we call Aperture Open. And I'll explain that in a minute. But, you know, that is um, cloud native, right? So built from the ground up on AWS. API first, meaning the product really is an API set related to digital banking. That is targeted toward much larger financial institutions than Aperture Express is. So think, you know, sort of $10 billion and above asset size financial institutions. So here's how we think of it. So Aperture Express is... um, it is an ideal out of the box digital banking solution for community banks and credit unions. So it has all of the features and functions that a bank needs to engage with their customers through digital channels. It does everything that that you know a bank customer or a credit union member needs to do as they do their mobile banking. Um, it is uh, uniquely positioned as open. Right. And hopefully we get a chance to talk about open banking and what that means in today's market. But when I say open in the express context, what I mean is that we give our clients the flexibility to use whatever third party solutions they need to plug into our digital banking platform to serve the needs of their unique the, the needs of their unique customer bases. So it's connected to literally all of the core banking platforms in the U.S. Mm-hmm. We offer, you know, the banks can choose which of the bill pay providers they want to use. And we have dozens and dozens of third party integrations, you know, on our Aperture Express platform. So that really allows the financial institutions to tailor their user experience using the best of what's out there in the market. So great out of the box experience, flexible in terms of partners that are integrated to it, a real focus on customer service. And this is one of those things, Mike, I think where a lot of businesses talk about this. Like we part, we really partner with our customers, but we really did build Aperture Express with the idea of being true partners to our clients and making sure that they have hands-on service, you know, all day, every day. And we structured our team to make sure that's possible. Mm. And then the last thing I'd say about Aperture Express, and I think this is somewhat unique in, in our part of the market, but you know, we're a SaaS platform, right? So Express, there's you know, this one single code base that serves all of our hundreds of clients. It's highly configurable and clients have the option. Everything's feature flagged, right? So they can, you know, take certain features or not, but it's one single code base. Mm-hmm. But what that means is we've got re- primarily really one product roadmap. So you know, our product team spends a lot of time mm-hmm. figuring out what are the most impactful things that we can put on our pro- product roadmap that would be, um, you know, relevant to the largest, our, the largest number of our clients. But there will always be things that, you know, either aren't on our platform or are not on our product, product roadmap that specific clients need. So we've actually set aside in the express business three scrum teams, right, development capacity to do funded development work on behalf of our clients. So we say, you know, I think if you were, if you were a financial institution using one of the bigger digital banking providers, and you said, you know, I want ABC and it's not, you don't have it on your platform. The answer would be something like, well, we'll put it on our roadmap and hopefully we'll get to it someday. Or sorry, we're not going to do that. And what's really cool about Express is we've set this capacity aside. So we'll actually do custom development for our clients. So if they come to us and say, we really need this third party integrated, or we really want this feature, we can say to them, we've got a team you know, standing by to do it. So I think those four things are what really differentiate mm. Express in the market. And then, sorry, I'll stop there. That was a lot. Any, <laughs> <No>. <laughs> any questions about that? <laughs> That's, I, I almost think like, what is a, what is a local community bank doing? You know, it, it, I think of it as like, okay, prior to the internet, the community bank has a physical, you know, box that they're in. They have an yeah. office. So you can come into the office. So you can talk to people that's some value. Then they actually pr- physically protect your money. That's some value. Uh, then, then you can go in and they interview you in person to give you a loan. All those things, like you don't need the in-person, you don't need to protect any physical money, really. You, you are, are primarily, I think, offering a software service. When I think of my bank, I mean, I think of the user interface. I think of like, how, how long does it take to move stuff in and out? You know, what features do they have on the software? And I know that a lot of these things have to be operationally built behind the scenes. It's not just software, yeah. but I think of like the value a community bank provides in my mind is not very 
like what is, what are they doing that's unique in each area? I mean, how do you? How, another way of asking this question is, how is consolidation not inevitable? Where we go from like however many thousands of banks we have, community banks, to you know twenty of the greatest UI uh, UX web web based banks. Yeah. I'm, so great question. Um, so consolidation is not only inevitable, but it continues to happen, right? So depending on who's counting. Um, we have in the U.S. market today about 10,000 community banks and credit unions. 10,000, right? Um, 20 or 30 years. That's a lot. I mean, how can there even be that many? God. It's a lot. But, you know, 20 or 30 years ago, there were 20,000, right? So consolidation is inevitable. And if you look at, you know, assets, you know, it's it's heavily skewed toward the large. I mean, the huge banks that, you, you know, cities and B of A's and Chase's, They've got a significant portion of the asset. So then, so then your question is, okay, well, what is the role of a community bank given, given that context? Um, the way here's how I think about it. Um, so the core business of any bank, including community banks, it, it's all about gathering deposits and making loans, right? So that's that's what they do. I mean, and a whole bunch of technology on top of that, and you know, a lot of fintechs out there doing banking type things, and a lot of times they need to create partnerships with banks, but when it comes down to it, gathering deposits and making loans. And then there are two, you know, relative to that, there are two principles that are really important for banks. Trust and convenience. Do I trust this is the place to uh, where I can, you know, keep my money? Do I trust this is the place where I can get a, you know, a, a good loan at a reasonable rate? And it, is it convenient for me to do my banking business? So I, mean, I think those two principles are, you know, really important as it relates to community banks. Um, Community banks and credit unions, I think, have always had the advantage of, you know, hands-on local customer service, right? So these are, especially as it it relates to making loans, right? So in a local, traditionally, you think of a community bank as part of a local geographic community. They have bankers out there who are making loans to small businesses in their community or medium-sized businesses in their community. They have the advantage of knowing those businesses knowing who their customers are um, and being able to provide, you know, really in-person hands-on high-touch service. That will Mm. continue to be an advantage. The question is, with technology changing, how can you combine what most customers expect today, even customers of, you know, smaller community banks, which is I can do almost everything through digital channels without high-touch personal service. So I think... Mm. So really, for me, the name of the game for community banks and credit unions is how do you start to seamlessly merge, you know, great service through digital channels without losing that personal touch that you've always had? So I I always say, if you're a community bank, you know, all of your customers at some time will want to get some service through digital channels. And some of your customers will want to get all of their service through digital channels, which means you need to have great digital service and capability through online and mobile banking. But that doesn't mean you can just totally lose, you know, the idea of really hands-on, high-touch personal service. So thinking about how you merge those things is important. And then, and I'm jabbering, Mike, so sorry, but I get all excited <laughs> about these topics. But then you also start to think about, well, in today's world and going forward, what really is the definition of a community? Right. And I think we're going to see a big shift maybe from yeah. community and banking terms being defined geographically to maybe community be, being defined, you know, based on like minded consumers or, you know, uh, you know, groups of uh, bank customers who have the same financial product needs versus just living in the same place. So I think you're going to start to see a shifting definition of community. And you're going to start to see community banks who can get really specialized around serving niches of customers. You know, if the niche before was because they live close by, the niche might be something else, but you can still be successful, you know, serving a niche is how I look at it. Yeah, no, that makes a lot of sense. You're right. The community is not local the way it used to be. Yeah. Um, two, two questions come to mind, and yeah. these might might be dumb questions, yeah. but uh, bear with me. What, what is the difference between a credit union and a community bank? Yes, that is not a dumb question. And um, for all of the uh, community bankers out there and credit, credit union uh, executives out there, I'm going to totally 
butcher. <laughs> That's okay. <laughs> Typically, you would think of a credit union as being more member oriented. So they, not that banks are customer oriented, but you know they're built. You know, they, they were created um, out of communities of customers, and they call them members who participate in the same kind of activity. So a lot of you know you'll see. Um, you might see like credit unions, you know, affiliated with local utility organizations. As it, so it, mm. it's more of a membership feel. The community or credit unions are typically really focused on membership experience at the expense of maybe profit. They're typically more retail banking focused than business banking focused, although not always. And then a community bank you can think of as, you know, more of a full service bank like you would think of, right? So they are mm -hmm. uh, for profit. Uh, they are serving retail customers and business banking customers. That's it. And like I said, I probably mm. really butchered that, but that's kind of philosophically. I'm with you. I'm with you. Yeah. yeah. They have yeah. largely different different origins, and so they look different today. That's right. Uh, yeah. And there's probably different rules, regulations around them to some that's extent. Right. You got it. Um, can banks, are, is there any difference between of the 10,000 banks that we have in this country, are there differences between how much a bank uh, can loan out to how much they have to have in the bank? Do you know, do you know this? Like if I, you know, maybe are, are they all the same or is there, can yeah. they lend more than they have? And I'm they can't. So again, that. they can't. I'm, okay. They cannot. And again, I'm not, I'm not an expert here, but so yeah, the, no, the, I know the basics of it at a very high level is your deposit base, right? Which means, um, you know, the money that your customers are putting in their checking accounts and their savings accounts and their CDs has to be roughly equivalent to the amount of money the bank is loaning out. And there are ratios, right, mm -hmm. the banks mm -hmm. and bank mm -hmm. regulators look at to make sure that, you know, your loan book isn't too far off of your deposit base. So, you know, in order to grow on the loan side, you know, banks have to be collecting more deposits to sort of sustain that growth. Mm, yeah, that makes sense. Yeah, uh, <laughs> I'd always wondered that. I think I heard one time that there was some ratio that they could lend out to nine times more than they had, but that that was probably not right. Uh, it's probably something yeah, it's, like it's, that. Yeah, and for the bankers out there, again, I probably totally butchered that. But there's some there's some equivalency between deposits on book and loans on book that they have to maintain. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, going back to your earlier point. Um, uh, it, on the community bank side, I'm thinking about what, because there are a lot of different communities out there. Yeah. There's so many different types of, of people that are interested in so many different things. Um, and I'm trying to wrap my mind around whether the future of banking looks like a software product that I have one of you know 50 tabs open my, on my computer and my bank is just one of those. And I just think of it as a software service that just holds my money and moves stuff around. Yeah. Or if it's if it's more of a community. You know, there's people I know that are tied to it. There's some, there's something about money and the holding of money and, and the, the me personally, or my, the people that I know. Cause when I think of community, I think of a network of people that all know each other or many of them do. And yeah. I'm trying to connect that concept to money and banking. And maybe it, maybe the future is that there is no connection, but I, I don't, I don't know. I don't know if you have any thoughts on that. <laughs> I think, I mean, I, there definitely is a connection, right? If you think about like the mm. origins of community banks and back to those principles of trust and convenience, right? It's like, if you're going to, if you're going to take your money and put it in a bank, you want it to be the bank across the street because you can see that bank and you yeah. know the banker and you trust, you trust that your money's in a good place, yeah. right? So I don't think that goes away, right? You know, sort of digital mm -hmm. communities for banking, you still want to have that, you know, that feeling of trust. And some of that's regulatory and, you know, the banks need to be, have all their infosec requirements and all those things in place. Um, mm -hmm. But, you know, when I think about, and I'd be interested, uh, Mike, what do you think? So, but when I think, you know, this idea is a, is a bank going to be a bank or is it going to be a software company? And m maybe it's going to be, you know, a, a merging of the two. But when I think about, um, maybe the longer term future of banking. I think, you know, of a really cool experience where you could think about your digital bank as your financial partner for life and an entity, a technology entity probably with real bankers behind it 
that is ensuring that you are getting the very best financial outcomes with a minimal amount of effort. And when we talk about, you know, there's this whole notion of open banking out there, which is really important, mm. right? And, um, you know, the, the traditional notion of open banking is I want to take my bank account information or maybe even my bank account balances and extend that into digital domains that my bank doesn't own for my convenience, right? So, mm -hmm. you know, maybe it's something like I'm a small business and I've got some practice management software that I use to run my practice. Wouldn't it be convenient if, you know, through APIs, if my bank accounts were extended into that practice software tool so that I can do it all in one mm. place? That's part of open banking, right? Another part of open banking is, um, you know, can we get the very best third party solutions integrate seamlessly integrated into a holistic user experience on the bank's digital domain? So that if I'm doing things like, you know, paying my taxes or checking my inventory or whatever, can I do all that from my bank's digital domain? And it needs to go both ways. But I think that maybe is leading toward this future of just effortless, you know, the best financial outcomes effortlessly. And you can think about a future where your bank, and again, back to this, those principles of trust and convenience, they're just doing things on your behalf. And they're pulling in information from all kinds of different entities that you do business with or all kinds of information sources to make sure that you're getting the very best financial outcome. So you, you can think, here's how I think about it. And this is maybe crazy. And you know, it's maybe 20 years from now, but shoot, <laughs> shoot. Yeah. You're, you're, you know, you're in your, you're, you got your earpiece in and you just say, you know, Hey, Hey bank, Hey, Mike's bank, how am I doing today? Um, and the answer is, well, all your bills are paid. And, you know, by the way, your credit card information was stolen, but we took care of it for you. We provisioned a new card to your mobile phone. And by the way, you know, it looks like your investments aren't doing that great. So we automatically adjusted them for that for you. Things just happen, right? And if you can think about the bank having the technology and the technology supported business relationships to give you that holistic experience without ha you having to put any effort into it and with you trusting the bank to give you the best outcomes, that's a really cool future. And I think that's maybe where open banking is leading and they're going to be step functions along the way, right? There are things that community banks need to be doing now to get onto, you know, a path that gets them to that kind of future. And there's something in the middle and there's something, you know, longer term, but I, yeah. I think that's a cool, you know, maybe future for banks. And that gives, that creates a lot of room for a lot of different banks to develop different kinds of services. Yeah. Yeah. I, I think you're right. I think in my mind, the word banking is kind of dissolving. Like if I think of it conceptually, historically, it's a very simple process of storing money and then taking loans out. But now, I mean, I think of when I think of banking, I, it doesn't, it's kind of amorphous. It really, to me, it's like, well, I have a business and so I have to send invoices and collect invoices and pay clients and pay contractors. And I have my personal, you know, uh, brokerage account or my, my crypto holdings and I have a, a wallet and my credit cards and they're all, it's just, everything's kind of. It's like, and then I have a checking account at USA and Fidelity account and they all, and then there's a company that you can use to connect them all together and see where everything is. Uh, but they, they each serve different purposes and the lending piece is like an app. It's like, that's, that's one portion of, I have a condo in LA and I have a, a mortgage for that condo. So there's, there's some bank that is giving me money to buy this condo. But it's still that it's not a significant part of my life. It's like uh, I don't even have a relationship with this bank. They were just the ones that my real estate agent found, and it, it's almost like it's so it's so vast the yeah. number of things that I'm doing because people's lives are more complex. And I think is the complexity of people's lives. There's so much pressure from from the world, the startup founders building products that are, it's like, I, I met a guy that was building an ETF, an ETF, uh, tradable on NASDAQ for crypto. It's like, well, where's that going to sit? How's that fit into banking? Yeah. And then it's like, what about foreign exchange and all the ability to trade with people internationally and all, and all these other instruments that come about. And so I, I almost think of it like a phone where you have all the apps and each app does something different. And an app would be like a feature. And then collectively, the whole thing is we call it banking. But banking is just where the where your money that you have control over goes. Uh, and it's just, it's so much more complicated than it once was. I, I, re I really like that. And you, you can think about 
the apps that are on the banking phone, um, yeah, they just need to be expanded, right? And there, there are a certain set of apps, right, or services that banks traditionally provide that they'll continue to provide. But it's really important for them to be able to pull in services from third parties to create that holistic user experience for you as a you know yeah. as a customer of the bank. Yeah, the one that the one that I I I I feel is like the Achilles heel for small banks or maybe innovation generally is the credit card because the credit card is you know I if I have um I use a a bank uh, Novo you know there's a few online web based banks uh-huh. and it's great but they don't do credit cards and I don't think any of them do and it it, fe- it feels like the credit card is almost this. Um, you know, you have to, I don't know what it is in banking, like what banks have access to issue credit cards or how that process works. But the credit card is this is, it seems like a barrier to entry for more of the web based focus banks. And, and I wonder if it's because of the, the relationships with Experian and the three credit bureaus, where it's almost like credit is consolidated. And I, I feel one major innovation that will break things open more is when we rethink how credit is assessed. And uh, instead of just you know hitting Experian and they come back with some number and that's how we decide how much you, we can give you, it's like well that doesn't that doesn't feel like the end state, especially because Experian got hacked a few years ago and sure. millions of people's social security numbers are out there. So I think when that and maybe that's a blocker for regulation, maybe it's a combination of regulation and innovation. But I think that would open up a lot when we rethink. Maybe a credit card isn't the right way to think about it. Maybe it's a uh, you know credit. I don't know. I don't know what the answer is, but it feels like thinking of a plastic card in my phone issued by a major bureau that gives me a number and how much I'm worth. It, it, that feels like it needs to be shaken up a little bit. And I think if that happens, that would change a lot. Uh, yeah, I, I agree. I mean, I th- you know, credit cards are unsecured lending, right? That just, that requires a bank mm-hmm. to have a different level of risk appetite and a different level of capabilities around, you know, underwriting that risk so that, that might be some of the reason you don't see some of these, you know, de novo banks go into that first, but they'll probably mature yeah. into it. But, and then also, I think, Mike, you, you know, the younger demographic, right, may be averse to credit cards because they went through, you know, the 2008 crisis and you know, they prefer to manage their spending with the money they have versus credit. Um, that may, maybe, maybe not, but that, but that might be part of it. Mm. 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 Yeah. It, it, it also seemed like if you could give a little bonus, you know, merchants say, I don't know why they don't do this already because they, they pay a fee when they accept credit cards. Yeah. But, you know, if you can, I don't know if, if you know about that, but I'm always curious why they don't say, oh, use a debit card and get 2% off instead of playing the whole game of like, okay, merchant has to pay, pay to accept a credit card. And then the credit card company gives a little bonus, you know, a little 1% bonus. So then people prefer to use a credit card over debit card. Yeah. You get into, uh, yeah, the economics of payments, you know, credit versus debit is complex and fascinating. Yeah. And, you know, network rules, you know, MasterCard Visa, you know, what they allow merchants to do and not do in terms of steering toward different types of mm. payment types, you know, that's all, it's all mixed up in there too. Yeah. Yeah, I know. Apple gets so much flack for uh, taking the 30% and controlling the app store, but somehow no one ever talks about Visa and the <laughs> dominating role they have. Uh, but yeah, I'll have to save that for another conversation. Chris, this is a lot of fun, man. I really enjoyed talking to you, get to know you and uh, learning what you guys are doing at Aperture. Um, anywhere that people can reach you, are you uh, on any social medias or uh, are you guys looking for anything in particular, uh, hiring or raising money or I guess Yep. customers i'm sure and so aperture itself the company is on, is on all the socials um you can you can find me probably most easily on on linkedin in this in this context um i guess that's it um yeah yeah so we're excited right i mean we're excited with what we're doing in community banking with express and then you know on open you know just participating in this evolving world of you know open banking and especially helping larger banks and de novo banks you know, have the tools they need to create a really, really unique and cool user experience, you know, through, through our APIs is what we're all about on Aperture Open. So it's, it's a fun place to be. There's been so much innovation in our space and it's going to continue. Yeah, that's fun, man. Yeah. Well, I really enjoyed the conversation and uh, we'll talk to you soon. Sounds good. Thank you, Mike. All right. Bye-bye.